History Month begins in 1915, half a century after the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in the United States. That September, the Harvard-trained historian Carter G. Woodson and the prominent minister Jesse E. Moreland founded the Association of the Study of Negro Life and History, ASNLH, an organization dedicated to researching and promoting achievements by black Americans and other peoples of African descent. Since 1976, every American president has designated February as Black History Month and endorsed a specific theme. The Black History Month 2021 theme is Black Family. Representation, Identity, and Diversity explores the African dysphoria and the spread of Black families across the United States. This poem was written by Mari Evans, one of America's greatest poets from the Black Arts Movement. Speak the truth to the people. Talk sense to the people. Free them with honesty. Free the people with love and courage for their being. Spare them the fantasy. Fantasy and slaves. A slave is enslaved can be enslaved by unwisdom, can be re-enslaved while in flight from the enemy, can be enslaved by his brother whom he loves, his brother whom he trusts, whom he loves, his brother whom he trusts, whom he, whom he loves, his brother with the loud voice and the unwisdom. Speak the truth to the people. It is not necessary to green the heart, only to identify the enemy. It is not necessary to blow the mind, only to free the mind. To identify the enemy is to free the mind. A free mind has no need to scream. A free mind is ready for other things, to build black schools, to build black children, to build black minds, to build black love, to build black impregnability, to build a strong black nation, to build. All right, so what's the name of the band? The name of the band is Speaking of Peace. How did you come up with the um, name? I like to come up with names that are uh, oh. action driven and, you know, and you know, if, if I thought about something that's actually important to be talking about, it's, it's an ongoing conversation. <laughs> and so the, you know, the idea of speaking of peace is, you know, that's what we should be doing uh, wow. in, in those directions. Yeah. Um, so if there's someone watching this and they're passionate, uh, whether about jazz music or about music in general, and they're doing the work into practice, is there any advice that you give um, to young musicians or musicians who are new, um, just picking something up, what did, did someone give you some advice or, or is there something you would give to them to say, here's how to take it to the next level. Here's how to go beyond what you are. I would say, first of all, get the very best instrument that you can find. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, the instrument itself will inspire you to keep on. And, and after that, it's just practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. I would not have expected that. That is really, <laughs> that's really interesting. Anybody else? Can you say the question one more time again? So if uh, there's a young musician or someone who's new, uh, picking up a new instrument or, or wanting to learn a new style of music, um, where, how can they begin to take what they're practicing to the next level? I would say um, in addition to what Eddie just said, that was, that, that's great advice. Um, Fundamentals, just mm -hmm. fi finding someone to help you learn the fundamentals of your instrument, whether it's scales, uh, rudiments, whatever it is, the, the, the basic things you just have. And, and, and remember why you started the thing in the first place. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, so that as you get into the, 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 the minutia of the fundamentals and getting into this or that or whatever, or you get, you know, you can come back to why you picked it up in the first place. Yeah. Brilliant. 
also just add to never let your self-consciousness get in the way, because mm-hmm. uh, there's always going to be people that are better than you. Mm-hmm. You gotta keep pushing through. Oh, that's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm among the giants, uh, especially with the people in the There's so much. So what's next? What's next for you guys? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> what's next for me? Well, I, I, I spend most of my time teaching in Dayton Public Schools. And, um, and what's next for me is every day, you know, being ready for my students, being ready to try to take them another step further and another step further and building band programs from scratch. Um, so to constantly inspire and just also always take a look at what I'm doing to make sure I'm pushing myself to grow as a teacher and be the best I can be for them. Also, um, what's next for me is um, figuring out um, how to be a better father, which actually I should have said first. You know, the, the music we played today, um, just that last that piece we played is called Closer to Heaven. And it's actually inspired by losing my son. And... You know, and it's like every day is one more step closer to seeing my son again. Um, and so even, even at, you know, so and then also the thing about it is I have my daughter still to raise. How do I make sure I'm there for her? And for me during uh, because of just how our schedules have changed, I, I'm actually able to take her to school every day, which I wasn't able to do before because of my work schedule. Uh, also, I've gotten, you know, I've got our grandson. Uh, so. Um, I'm able to spend some time with my grandson, and so it's just every day trying to be a better, be a better father, grandfather, and a better teacher, and a better husband. You know? Yeah, and a better husband too. Sorry. Amen. Yeah. I know Mr. Professor Jeremy Winston has so much in in the, the making. You want to kind of elaborate? Um, you're talking about next steps kind of thing? Oh, well, you know, first of all, let me just say, I'm so, I was happy to be able to step in today and feel, and this was exciting. I, I came in not, you know, you know, not necessarily thinking I was going to do that, but I can't tell you how, you know, it's, it's fun to, you know, I love jazz and, you know, you know, it was just really fun to be able to step in. So thanks so much for letting me play. Yeah. Let me play. We appreciate you. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, I have, um, I've been working with, Kind of with my nonprofit, German Winston Corral International, and uh, we have um, been doing a lot of things. Well, no one's traveling or performing, but we're working on uh, some. Uh, we're beginning the, the process of working on some projects that will come out later this spring, early summer, uh, as well as uh, supporting school students at HBCUs, offering scholarships for music majors specifically. Uh, in the name of one of our members who passed away, uh, Gregory Darty, a few years ago, and uh, uh, and so we established a scholarship in his name. So we're excited to get that launched off, and uh, and getting, hopefully we'll be able to. <laughs> perform soon, you know. Right. We'll know what this whole pandemic <laughs> right. thing is gonna, right. you know, do. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to get together and do that. So looking mm-hmm. forward to that. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I have to say something yes. real quick that I should have said. And I'm sorry to, no, before I before we go to Eddie and Matt. Um, I'm also working on an album, and I should have said that oh, wow. because that is actually something that? that is a next step. And this music is also going to be part of that album. Um, so I should have said that. I received a. That's um, okay. Uh, a, a grant, uh, an artist opportunity grant recently uh, here in Montgomery County, and so that's been a great opportunity. So I should have said that. That's so, your sorry. Fault.
Thank you. 
1915, Carter G. Woodson traveled to Chicago from his home in Washington, D.C. to take part in a national celebration of the 50th anniversary of emancipation. He earned his bachelor's degree and master's degree at the University of Chicago and still had many friends there. And as he joined the thousands of black Americans overflowing from the Coliseum, which housed exhibits highlighting African-American achievements as the abolition of slavery, Woodson was inspired to do more in the spirit of celebrating black history and heritage. Before he left Chicago, he helped found the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, the ASNLH. A year later, Woodson single-handedly launched the Journal of Negro History, in which he and other researchers brought attention to the achievements of black Americans. In February 1926, Woodson set out a press release announcing the first Negro History Week. He chose February because the month contained the birthdays of both Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, two prominent men whose historic achievements African Americans had already celebrated. Lincoln's birthday was February 12th, and Douglass, a former slave, hadn't known his actual birthday, but had marked the occasion on February the 14th. As schools and other organizations around and across the country quickly embraced Woodson's initiative, he and his colleagues struggled to meet the demand for course materials and other resources. The ASNLH formed branches all across the country through its national headquarters, remained centered in Woodson's Row House on 9th Street in Washington, D.C., the house was also home base for the Associated Publishers Press, which Woodson had founded in 1921. Carter G. Woodson was the author of more than 20 books, including A Century of Negro Migration, which was published in 1918, The History of the Negro Church, which was also published in 1921, and The Negro in Our History, which was published in 1922. His most celebrated text, though, was The Miseducation of the Negro, which was published in 1933. Woodson also worked in education as principal for the Armstrong Manual Training School in Washington, D.C., and dean at Howard University and the West Virginia Collegiate Institute. So how did it begin? Black History Month's humble beginnings will be displayed in this video that follows. Black History Month, also known as African American History Month in the U.S., is an annual observance in Canada, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and the United States. It began as a way for remembering important people and events in the history of the African diaspora. It is celebrated annually in the United States and Canada in February, as well as in the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and the Republic of Ireland in October. The precursor to Black History Month was created in 1926 in the United States when historian Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History announced the second week of February to be Negro History Week. This week was chosen because it coincided with the birthday of Abraham Lincoln on February 12th and of Frederick Douglass on February 14th, both of which dates black communities had celebrated together since the late 19th century. From the event's initial phase, primary emphasis was placed on encouraging the coordinated teaching of the history of American blacks in the nation's public schools. The first Negro History Week was met with a lukewarm response, gaining the cooperation of the Departments of Education of the states of North Carolina, Delaware, and West Virginia, as well as the city school administrations of Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Despite this far from universal acceptance, the event was regarded by Woodson as one of the most fortunate steps ever taken by the association, and plans for a repeat of the event on an annual basis continued apace. By 1929, the Journal of Negro History was able to note that with only two exceptions, officials with the State Departments of Education of every state with considerable Negro population had made the event known to that state's teachers and distributed official literature associated with the event. Churches also played a significant role in the distribution of literature in association with Negro History Week during the initial interval, with the mainstream and black press aiding in the publicity effort. 
Negro History Week was met with enthusiastic response. It prompted the creation of black history clubs, an increase in interest among teachers, and interest from progressive whites. Negro History Week grew in popularity throughout the following decades, with mayors across the United States endorsing it as a holiday. Black History Month was first proposed by black educators and the Black United Students at Kent State University in February 1969. The first celebration of Black History Month took place at Kent State one year later, the whole month of February in 1970. Six years later, Black History Month was being celebrated all across the country in educational institutions, centers of black culture, and community centers both great and small. When President Gerald Ford recognized Black History Month during the celebration of the United States Bicentennial, he urged Americans to, quote, seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. What Carter G. Woodson would say about the continued celebrations of Black History Month is unknown, but he would smile on all the honest efforts to make black history a field of serious study and provide the public with thoughtful conversation Dr. and celebration. Dr. Martin King Jr. was born uh, January 15, 1929, in Atlanta, Georgia. He was later assassinated April 4, 1968, in Memphis, Tennessee. Thurgood Marshall, another brilliant and powerful leader, was born July 2, 1908, and passed away January 24, 1993. Shirley Chisholm, was born November 30th, 1924, and passed away January 1st, 2005. President Barack and Michelle Obama. The 44th president of the United States and the first African-American president was elected over Senator John McCain of Arizona on November the 4th, 2008. Obama, a former senator from Illinois, whose campaign slogan was, change we can believe in, and yes, we can, was subsequently elected to a second term over Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney. A winner of the 2009 Nobel Peace Prize, Obama's presidency was marked by the passage of the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare. The killing of Osama bin Laden by SEAL Team 6, the Iran nuclear deal, and the legalization of gay marriage by the Supreme Court. First Lady Michelle LaVon Robinson Obama is a lawyer, writer, and the wife of the 44th President, Barack Obama. She is the first African American First Lady of the United States. Through her four main initiatives, she became a role model for women and an advocate for healthy families, service members and their families, higher education, and international adolescent girls' education. Peter Matthews is a much sought after author and speaker who has preached, lectured, or keynoted extensively throughout the United States, India, Jamaica, England, Switzerland, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and South Africa over the past two decades. A reoccurring guest contributor to the Huffington Post, he is also the co-founder of the Global Village, a Methodist church collective of seven churches from which he has secured more than $500,000 to initiate creative solutions to persistent problems in critical core urban areas. In that capacity, he also leads a staff of four to renew the historic Methodist faith from an international context while developing a pipeline for a new generation of persons wanting to work in historic African American congregations with Methodist Theological School of Ohio in Delaware. Currently, Peter is the lead pastor for McKinley United Methodist Church and Grace United Methodist Church, both in Dayton, Ohio. He is the youngest lead pastor in the 130-year history of the church. In addition, 
Peter is the inaugural executive director of the John E. Moore Senior Citizen for, Equal for Equity. The center, Dayton's leading faith-based social incubator, is McKinley's social service agency that serves more than 3,500 persons annually alongside the University of Dayton, the Urban League, Primary Health Solutions, Citywide Development Corporation, West Dayton Strong, and Sinclair Community College, and now responsible for allowing his church to be used as a vaccination location for COVID-19. The legacy that we leave as Black Americans and the legacy that God has left for us. When I think about as black Americans and the legacy, I can only think about my great, great, great grandfather, Tom Bennett, and his beautiful wife, Elsie Bennett, who were slaves in Oldham County, Kentucky, on a tobacco plantation. And my great, great, great grandfather, Tom Bennett, he understood what he needed to do to maintain and keep his family from being sold. He worked very, very hard. He built a great relationship with Master Bennett. And as a consequence or as a result of that relationship, he was able to have six children that stayed with him and were born into slavery on that tobacco plantation. When the Civil War came around, Master Bennett went to the Civil War as well as my grandfather, and he survived the Civil War. However, Master Bennett did not survive. He died in the war. After the emancipation and the war had been won and the Emancipation Proclamation had been signed, my grandmother's grandmother, Edmonia Bennett, was born in 1867 as the first of our family to be born outside of slavery. Though the legacy that my great 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 grandfather left for me is that he learned how to live within the reality that he was was in. He made the best of it and he survived and succeeded. He had eight children in all and lived a very full life uh, after slavery. God has a legacy for us because we have become much closer to him through the trials that we've gone through as a people. And these trials that we've gone through, they are necessary to build our character. As Jesus Christ is coming again, we will be ready. We have the relationship and we thank God for his legacy of love and his promise to save us. Thank you. Okay, we are here with Miss Jasmine Hines. Hello. Hi. How are you? Pretty good in yourself? I'm good. I'm good. So tell me about Jasmine. I know you're a dancer and all that good stuff. So how long have you been dancing? 15 years. So you started when you were two, right? Um, <laughs> not necessarily two. I was around eight or nine and actually started here at McKinley. Oh, you did? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> So you dance with the, um, what the other girls' names? Uh, I can't think of their names. Was it Dominique and all them? Yes. Wow. But that was so far back. We were babies. But, okay. Yeah. Wow. So what is your creative process like? I know I saw you dance and you're awesome. Um, thank you. And it usually depends on the music or the topic. Okay. Or the ministry in this case. Okay. Um, Sometimes the lyrics just come to me and then I get the movement that way. Or sometimes I already have something created and then I just find the right song. Wow. Yes. So what do you like to co collaborate like? How, how, do you, how do you pick the songs? Is it just how you feel or? I'm not gonna take all the credit. You My mom take a, usually your picks mother. the songs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. So your, so your mother is like your? Momager, for sure. She's your mama. Absolutely. <laughs> mama tour? Yes. I've never heard that word before. Yes. Okay, can you explain that? Um, 
She's your mother and she's your manager. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so does she tell you what to do or is it just something that you just kind of come, come with, together? I come up with the movement and then she'll say yes or no. Wow. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to open a show for any artist, who would you like it to be? Charlie Wilson. Ch Charlie Wilson? Absolutely. Why Charlie Wilson? I like him too. He's a, he's a great artist. I have an old school heart, but I just yes, love you do. his sound. <laughs> um, he has a lot of slow songs, which can be partner work, but right. then he also has a lot of upbeat songs. Wow. I just really like his music. So what is the most useless talent you have? Useless, not useful. We all have them. Do you sing? That would be one. <laughs> I started, you used to sing? yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I also play piano, maybe. I didn't know you played piano. It didn't last long. <laughs> oh, oh, you played piano. Yes. You so, should take that back up. I would say That's piano would probably be the useless for wow. me. We are victorious. We are victorious. We are victorious.
The cradle of humanity lies within the hands of Mother Africa, a unique mosaic of ecosystems that make up a diverse cultural landscape. Africa is a complex social and historical entity where the fashion is just as deep and colorful as the continent itself. There are many histories in which traditions of a given locality have become engaged and intertwined with form and fabric introduced from elsewhere. Fashion has always been a global language, a medium by which Africa's diversity chooses to speak to the world. Contrary to popular belief, some of the world's greatest empires originated in Africa. Therefore, it should be no surprise that a colorful world of fashion coincides with such a rich history. The evolution of African clothing is difficult to trace because of the lack of historical evidence. Every textile expresses the individuality of a place in a way that is completely unique, taking us on a journey through the fascinating history of the motherland through the clothing of our ancestors. Soon I will be done with the trouble of this world. Trouble of this world. Trouble of this world. Oh, and soon I will be done. With the trouble of this world, I'm going home to live with God. Said again, soon I will be done with the trouble. Oh, <laughs> 
sings 
that somebody that's watching the broadcast knows that when I know I'm going home to live with God, that means I'm not going to cuss you out because I'm going home to live with God. That means I can forgive. That means I've got a little bit more courage because there's something inside of me that's stirring like an eagle in its nest and it makes me shout when I should be crying. It makes me clap my hands when I should be sitting with my arms folded because I know that God knows me and if God knows me, that is enough. And so when I say soon, I'm not talking about after a while and by and by. I'm talking about right here and right now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on So every Sunday feels like the Super Bowl to me. Yes, sir. Hey, hey, I, I don't care who's playing on either side because I know on Communion Sunday, I'm reminded of who gets the victory. Soon, soon. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Let, let, me, let me say it this way. I, I know we're supposed to move on with the service. Let me, let me say it this way. My grandmama would say, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, then my soul shouts hallelujah. Let, let me say it this way. Grandma didn't get out of high school and didn't go to seminary or church school but she knew that she had to turn her mind on. I, I read, and I'm going to make sure the sister gets credit in the sermon. She says, you don't have to tell me anything about faith in God. I've seen my grandmama go to a cupboard that didn't have no food in it. <laughs> yes, sir. I've seen my grandmama go to a cupboard where there was no food and 30 minutes later, a feast came by. I, I, I'm not just talking about black heroes and sheroes that make history books. I, I, I'm talking about the way in which the brother talked about last week. Helen Brinkley and Cicely Tyson and Raymond Hummins. And, and you, that, that we have heroes and sheroes that are being worked out even right now. And we, in our enthusiasm, <laughs> in our excitement, we are always mindful that we don't simply practice, Lauren, religious calisthenics. We just don't jump up and down and scream about God locked in this beautiful building. But there's something about God's love that we cannot keep it to ourselves. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free.